Hello everybody, welcome back to Shapes.io. My name is Bins and this is part 4 of my Buttmam series, a video series in which I show and explain the mechanics behind the TMAM or True Make Anything machine I have built. As this is a sequential series, I invite you to go watch the first three parts if you haven't done so already. Now, while the previous video served as introductions and presented some theoretical concepts of the machine, today will be the first time in which we're gonna dive in and look at the actual factory itself. Now, previously I talked about the five-piece approach. This means that the factory will try to assemble the final shape from one up to four pieces or components, plus an optional fifth layer. In terms of how the TMAM operates, we can distinguish two stages, okay? You see this happening right now. The first stage is the analysis stage, in which the factory tries to figure out which pieces it'll need. And then, as soon as it has done so, the second stage is the actual creation of those pieces and the assembly towards the final product. Now, while theoretically, perhaps, it would make more sense for us to explore these stages in chronological order of the production line, meaning that we cover the first stage first and the second stage second, I decided to actually reverse that. And that is because the analysis bit was by far, and I mean by very, very far, the hardest part to do. Once the machine has figured out which pieces it needs, then the actual assembly part is a true cakewalk in comparison. And since this series is meant to progress, I figured perhaps it makes more sense to go over the easier parts first, because that way you are eased into it and we can gradually move on to deeper waters together as we progress through the different videos, as we progress from one video to the next, okay? And in that sense, today, we're going to start at the finish. Shall we have a look? So, first of all, I'm going to zoom out. And here it is. This is the, the physical part of the factory, which does the actual assembly of the four pieces. And as you can derive from, from, this, uh, from this overview right here, these, I have four machines and logically, each one is responsible for one of those pieces. Now, since all of these factories are, since all of these modules are identical, we only need to have a look at, at one of them because the, you know, the explanations there, the setup is, is it, it applies to all the other uh, modules as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I always find it easiest to orient myself when we, when we work from left to right. So I'm gonna take the, um, the assembler for the first piece. Now, if you recall, a piece in my machine can belong to one of two types. The first type of piece is a flat piece. And a flat piece consists of one layer only. And on that layer, there may be one up to four quadrants. The second type of piece has only half of a shape, which, mean, which may mean that it may be the top half of a shape, the bottom half of a shape, the left half or the right half of a shape. And the second type of piece may also have one up to four quadrants. However, in that case, um, it may be one up to four layers and each of the layers contains one quadrant. With, within the restriction that all of these quadrants are strictly located on one half of a shape. That is the, the second type. Now, in, in, in both of those cases, the piece can contain one up to four quadrants. And in that sense, it makes absolute sense what we see here, right? We see four identical modules and we can deduct from that easily that uh, we can suppose from that, which is the case, that each of these modules is responsible for one quadrant. Okay? 
Now, in terms of the input, I decided to work with uh, an Omni shape again, and I received some pushback. Uh, it was, you know, light criticism, maybe perhaps some constructive criticism about why I use these Omni shapes, because apparently, or at least that's what I've been told, uh, it's not as efficient. It works better if you work with separate lines containing circles, squares, stars, and, and windmills, and I shouldn't be using these Omni shapes. But the thing is, I deliberately ignore that, and I'm going to use the Omni shapes anyway. And the reason for that is because I simply prefer it that way. The Omni shapes give me the possibility to build a one size fits all kind of cutting module. You know, and I don't have to worry about putting the correct lines in. I can simply create this, this cutting module and then I can simply cut, copy, paste it onto all of my uh, input, you know, all of my inputs. That's basically, basically why I do that. So let's have a look at a machine that's actually running all of the components. There we go. All right, so I need a full belt of uh, input uh, in terms of the shape, in terms of the omni shape, I need a full belt of input. And then what will happen is um, each of these cutters is going to provide one fourth of a belt's worth of uh, the quadrant we need. In this case, a circle quadrant. Those four are going to come together to create a full belt. And then I'm going to immediately split that up. And with the help of uh, three stacking modules, three stacking units, I am going to create, I believe, one eighth. Oh, I have to, I have to cheat. I have a little cheat sheet right here. Let me have a look. Yeah, they they provide one fourth of a belt. That that's what it is. One fourth of a belt, and they are distributed. This is distributed over two painters. So each painter gets one eighth of a belt's worth. After being painted, they join to one fourth, and then I can cut that up into quadrants, rotate the quadrants, and since we are multiplying one fourth of a belt's worth by four quadrants, we get a full belt again. That's the way it works. And then in terms of color, um, I, dis I discovered that I only need one line of each color to supply a full module and that is because you know i was also told and I, I decided to follow up on that um i was also told that it's a lot more efficient to uh, do your painting first uh, what i did before was i cut the shape up into quadrants and then i painted the quadrants uh, and i've been told and uh, rightfully so that it's a lot more efficient to paint the full shape and then cut it up into quadrants because you can reduce the amount of paint you need fourfold. Uh, and since that is the case, I only need one full line of paint for an entire module, uh, an entire piece module. Okay, so then in terms of uh, in terms of the color, nothing spectacular going on. I have filters here. In case of the non-primary colors, I have two color mixers per color. So this is uh, this is yellow. This is the blue filter. This is uh, cyan. Sorry, this is this is green. This is cyan. Uh, screen freeze. Thank you. This is blue, uh, purple, and then two for white. So what'll happen is, um, in case of a non-primary color, I'm gonna get one fourth of a belt's worth maximum and that is going to be distributed over the two painters. However, if I get a primary color, then I might get more than one fourth of a belt's worth because, um, you know, it's not a guarantee that these colors are going to be needed in all of the machines, right? So I believe, yeah, in this case, I get half of a belt's worth. And in that case, that is the reason why I provided a little uh, storage overflow with a with a trash can right here. So it can output, it can trash whichever excess we might be getting. And then at the at the end of that machine, 
I created what I think is a is a cute little module. It has the uh, the correct shape connected with a wire, and it's basically just going to rotate my shape from whichever orientation it has, whichever corner it has, into the corner we need. And you know, it has like this kind of uh, windmill design, and whenever the shape is rejected because the corner, the orientation doesn't match what we want, then it gets out output to the, let's call it the zero side or the rejection side of the filter, and it will get rotated 90 degrees, and it will try again. And after a maximum of three tries, we will get uh, the correct orientation of that shape, the correct corner, 100% of the time and a full belt is being output. So, you know, I, I think this is cute, it's efficient, uh, it's, it's, con it's dense, you know, it doesn't take up a lot of real estate, doesn't take up a lot of space, so feel free to copy this design if you like. And then, let's see what else is there. Yeah, please recall that um, this module needs to be able to, cap to cope with two types of shapes. Sometimes you have flat shapes and sometimes you have floating f floating shapes, floating components, right? And if we have floating components, I explained this in, uh, in part number two, I believe, uh, then we need this scaffolding. And because of that, we need an extra set of staggers. So the first thing that is going to happen is um, the actual piece from our shape is going to be merged with the scaffolding. So I have a, uh, a stacking module, which I call the broad stacker, the condensed broad stacker. It has like two rows of uh, four stackers each. And then it also has this, this bypass module. You can see if I, if I cut this line, for example, then this filter will be activated and the other shapes start bypassing the stacker altogether. The, um, the reverse also holds true, so if, for example, I cut this line right here, then um, after a while the gray will start bypassing through this line right here. Right, so a very simple bypassing module that uh, works based on belt readers. Now, belt readers are also notorious for not being precise. I decided to not care about it, so... But the thing is that, you know, these belt readers, if they stop receiving input on the line, it will, they have like a little, I don't know, can I call it a cooldown period? It, it takes them some time to fall back to zero, to start emitting a zero signal. And um, in that sense, it will take some time for these bypass filters to activate. But I decided in practice, I don't really care. So anyway, uh, these shapes, they come together, or if we don't have, if we don't need a scaffolding piece, then uh, the actual piece just bypasses. Uh, this is joined in an identical uh, stacking module, again with two rows of four stackers. And then that moves into a broad stacker. Uh, the principle is exactly the same, except here I have one row of eight stackers instead of two rows of four. Um, also, a bypass mechanism that will be triggered, um, you know, if, if, um, if we have no input coming here, if we have no scaffolding pieces at all, then uh, this is the filter that gets activated, so um, the bypass is here, and if we don't have an input here, then the bypass will be activated right here, and it moves directly into the next section. Now the next section is a rotating section because in cases where we're dealing with a floating piece, we need to cut that up. We need to cut it in half and throw away the scaffolding. And I decided that the easier method of the two is to keep my cutting constant. So what I do is I always keep the right half and I always trash the left half. And in order to ensure that we keep the piece that we actually actually need, I needed to build a kind of rotating module in front of it. Uh, so it's going to rotate that if necessary, then it's going to cut that up, and it's going to counter-rotate um, in correspondence to the, the you know preliminary rotation right here. So we have that going on right here. 
Now, how that rotation system works, uh, I will get back to it if we have a look at the, the wiring later. Uh, but this is the end of the, of the piece assembly. So each, each of these modules is going to assemble one of four pieces. And then those four pieces will come together in the final stacker. This is the final stacker. It's a pretty efficient stacker, if I say so myself. And it is very, um, it is very easy to produce as well. It's light on resources. Um, it only has this wiring right here. And then, yeah, it's a bit, it, it's a bit misleading because I have a lot of wires right here, but actually the only, the only wiring that pertains to this module is this right here. This in combination with this. Screen freeze again. Excuse me, thank you. So in combination with this, this is the only wiring that actually pertains to this module. And what that does is it runs a cleaning mechanism. So as soon as any of these modules falls idle, then whichever queue may have been building up in the in the lines right here, they will be trashed right away. And the reason or, or the way that happens is with this uh, belt reader again. So as long as it has um, shapes running across it, this signal will be outputting a one. And that will mean that thanks to the NOT gate, this filter will output the shapes straight ahead. And this filter will output the shapes towards the right and into the stacker. And as soon as this falls to a zero, then the states of these filters will be flipped and they will start outputting uh, towards the trash, clearing out the the queues that we have. All right. So that's a, that's a pretty efficient stacker. These stacking modules, they stack the piece together. And as we can see, we get the, uh, the end result after that has been processed. Now, uh, there is a thing. Oh yeah, and then, the, sorry, first things first. Uh, the final piece might be uh, the fifth layer, which we discussed in previous videos. Uh, I just took the closest thing I could get, which is this uh, circle right here, this circle piece, and I run that into, uh, into this module if needed. Now, that is the physical bit. So I suggest let's have a look at the wiring bit. The wiring bit is going to be a bit more interesting, I think. So we get our pieces. First of all, we get our wires that come out from the analysis stage, right? The analysis stage, that's a whole, a whole, um, a whole different concept altogether. So um, after analyzing those pieces, they get output here. We are going to disregard this line for now, but the four pieces, they connect here and each one of these pieces runs into one of these modules, right? So let's have a look at this one again. Now, remember, we can have two types of pieces. One type is like this one. It's a floating piece, right? And the other type is a flat piece. And the modules need to be able to handle both of those. And the way it does is with this initial module right here. What it's going to do is this is going to determine whether we are dealing with a floating piece or a flat piece. And the, and, and the way it does that is actually super simple. It's ridiculously simple. The only thing we need is an unstacker. And the unstacker is simply going to try and see, do we have a top layer that we can take off? If so, then we will get a signal here. And that will trigger this transistor, or that will activate this transistor, and the, uh, the signal is output towards the top. If we have a flat piece, well, let's demonstrate that. So if we have a flat piece, let's say uh, like so, then there is no top layer to unstack. So we will get a null signal right here. And thanks to the NOT gate, that will trigger the bottom line. And the bottom line will run here. And the thing is, if we are dealing with a flat piece, then our individual quadrants are obtained by cutting the piece, right? So the signal needs to run into 
cutting modules over two over two levels, right? But if we are dealing with a floating piece, then our individual quadrants are obtained by unstacking, and that is why, if that is the case, we run the signal into an unstacker, and each of the unstackers gives me one of the needed quadrants. Additionally, if we are dealing with a floating, floating piece, we need the scaffolding. So what I do is I take the top layer off, I turn it gray, because, you know, it's, it's easier that way. And I'm going to rotate that um, diagonally. So, and now I need to pay attention. The top piece, the piece of the top layer, the quadrant of the top layer is actually the top left one. But it is displayed as top right because I have rotated my signal once here. So, this is actually the top left quadrant and in that sense our scaffolding piece is going to be the bottom right quadrant. There we go. There is the bottom right quadrant and the bottom right quadrant of our scaffolding connects to all of the four modules. Because if you recall from one of the previous videos, I told you that the scaffolding piece needs to be the same for all of the layers, right? So it is connected to all of the modules. And then the actual individual uh, quadrants of the actual shape, uh, they just run uh, regularly into the modules, you know, one line for each module. So let's have a look at what else there is. So we follow this line and then I had a screen freeze again. Then the first thing I do is I create a full piece, which you can see right here, by stacking this quadrant on top of itself. First diagonally, then with a 90 degree rotation. That's how we get the full shape. And by having the full shape always, I can ensure that the analyzer gets the correct signal without having to rotate the shape any further. So regardless of what the orientation of this quadrant is, regardless of which corner it is in, I can always run it through this module and get the output right here. So we get the color output, which runs down into the filters. We'll get back to it. Uh, and, this, and the shape output, which runs to the top. I cut it up so that I always get the top right. And this signal is then connected to, uh, excuse me, to the cutters right here. So it always gives me the top right quadrant. Then let's follow the, the, um, the color signal. So this is very simply connected to comparing units. The comparing units are connected to the filters. So if we have a yellow signal, for example, then these filters will open up and they will start mixing uh, green, green and red and outputting yellow. So that's, that's a very simple setup. And uh, next, what do we have here? If we have a gray shape, then the shapes need to bypass the painters, right? So that is what this does. If we have a gray shape right here, we'll be outputting a one signal and the, um, the OR gate right here will also produce a one signal. And in practice, that means that the shapes are not redirected towards the, towards the painters, but they are, they can continue straight on and they will bypass the, um, the painters altogether in case we're dealing with the red shapes. And then the final thing, as we said before, this uh, rotator module right here, it is connected to uh, the signal of our uh, either our actual piece, our actual quadrant, or the scaffolding piece. And in both cases, the rotators will do their thing, give us the correct orientation. <clears throat> and then those are connected to a, um, to a smart virtual stacker. I think by this time you should have seen you should have seen my smart virtual stacker, but in any case what this does is it provides the stacked signal, but it also provides a signal in case of one layer missing. So for example, let's suppose we don't have a layer, we don't have a signal here, then uh, this module will output the scaffolding piece. And if it's the other way around, let's 
wait for my uh, screen to unfreeze. There we go. Uh, in case we're missing this, then we get the other the other signal that can continue. That's how that works. Okay, so the signal is stacked virtually. It meets up with the other one is stacked virtually there as well. Meets up on the next layer right here is stacked virtually again. Uh, meets on the next layer, etc., and is connected to the uh, to the stackers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, what else is there? The modules. The bypassing modules of these individual stacking units is actually very simple. As I said, it works with the um, with the um, belt readers, which is not the most accurate, but which is absolutely accurate enough for my purposes. So what it does is it checks these belt readers, and if either we have um, if we have either this belt reader or, or this belt reader active, and this belt reader or this belt reader active, then that means we have input on both sides and we use the stacker. If we cut this line, for example, then this will become a zero. And because this is an AND gate, this will become a zero and that will, um, that will put all of the filters into bypass mode. Now these uh, modules also have a cleaning mechanism, right? Um, cleaning up the um, the queue that we may get, right? So um, we have additional filters connected. This is the cleaning filter right here on one side. And where's the cleaning filter on the other side? You know what? I don't think I have one. Oh yeah, it's right here. Here it is. There we go. So that has a, a self-cleansing mechanism as well. Let's connect this again. There we go. Is there anything else I need to talk about? Yeah, it just works the same right here. Works the same right here, but the layout is uh, is different. It's broad. Now, an interesting thing maybe to, to have a look at is that in this particular case, my piece has two layers, okay? We can see this right here. It has only two layers. However, I have four scaffolding pieces regardless and i decided to do that because it massively simplified my setup my setup this way is a lot more straightforward and it actually makes no difference in the end so i have connected my scaffolding piece to all of my four layers regardless of how many layers my actual piece has so what we see happening here is that we have no production of an actual piece, but we do have production of a scaffolding piece, right? And here, it's going to create a two-layer scaffolding piece. And that is going to connect with a two-layer actual piece. And that is going to elevate the actual red quadrants right here to layers three and four, even though we need them on layers one and two, right? However, because of the way Shapes.io works, as soon as we throw away the four layer scaffolding and the two red layers that are attached to them that are, you know, floating in the air, so to speak, as soon as we remove the scaffolding, those red pieces will fall down again and we get the actual outcome that we need. So that may be an interesting detail to take into consideration that even though, even though technically we are creating a lot more input uh, and then throwing it all away for nothing. Uh, in terms of setup, this was a lot easier to, to do. You know, because otherwise you're going to have to start to take into account how many layers do we have, how many scaffolding pieces do we need, etc, etc. So in terms of my wiring setup, you know, hooking all of that up to the machines and let it do its thing, it comes down to the same thing in the end. And in that way, uh, in that in that sense, I preferred this method, where technically we have needless complexity in the way our shapes are produced. Okay. Now another interesting thing I wanted to talk to you about, and I hope you remember my previous video where I talked about encoding signals, um, because I'm going to show you an example of a signal that has been encoded. I'm going to go back to the wiring layer. 
And we're going to go back to the beginning of our module, which in this case is right here. Okay. I haven't talked about this piece right here yet, this module right here. So if we are dealing with a floating piece, then it means we might need to rotate the piece in order to cut it, right? And here's what happens. If we get a floating piece, then uh, the signal is output right here. And I'm going to unstack the quadrants and I'm going to restack them again. And the reason I do that is because I want all of my floating bits to fall down as much as they can so that I have, you know, all of the pieces on the bottom layer. And that is going to tell me the orientation of my piece. So in this case, uh, we have the top two pieces, you know, but the left one is floating. In the unstacked and restacked bit, the signal, the, the, the sorry, the quadrant has fallen down to the lower level, to the, the lowest level. And the reason we need that is because I use analyzers. Now, I don't know if you know this, but an analyzer is always going to analyze the top right quadrant of your shape. And if you are dealing with multiple layers, then it's going to take the bottom layer. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. This, by the way, is regardless of orientation. Okay, which might be a bit confusing because... Okay, let's just have a look at this. Um, if we put this machine upright, we can tell that the, um, that the top right corner is being analyzed. However, if we rotate it like so, it might seem like the bottom, uh, the bottom right is being analyzed, which is not the case. Okay, so let's have a look at, let's, let's connect some shape, um, like so. Okay, we can see that the top right shape quadrant square uh, sorry circle quadrant is being analyzed even though confusingly enough the bottom right quadrant is you know highlighted right here so that take that into consideration that it is always the top right of your shape so it doesn't matter how we orient this right it's always going to output the um the red circle right here that is in case we are dealing with a shape with one layer. But now let's have a look at, for example, um, there. Let's have a look at this, at this shape instead. What we see happening here is even though we have a quadrant in the top right, it is not on the first layer. Right, and that's why this, um, what's it called anyway? Is it called the analyzer? Yeah, the analyzer doesn't output anything at all because it strictly analyzes the top right quadrant of the bottom layer, which this particular shape doesn't have, okay? So keep that in mind. And that is the reason why I unstack and restack this shape so that the floating pieces fall to the ground and in this piece, the analyzers are capable of telling me that our shape is located on the top half of, you know, the entire thing. So the piece is located on the top half of our shape. And with that being known, these analyzers are now going to um, spew out a value. One of these machines, one of these four machines is going to activate. In this case, it's this one. And this one activates in case we're dealing with a top piece, right? And that means that at the end of the machine, if we are dealing with a piece that is located on the, on the top half, that means that my rotators are going to have to rotate the shape 90 degrees clockwise. I'm, I hope I'm not making any mistakes here. If we are dealing with a right piece, then the rotators need to rotate 200 and 
70 degrees clockwise if they are dealing with a bottom piece. No, that's not correct. Rewind. If they are dealing with a right piece, they don't need to rotate. If they are dealing with a bottom piece, they need to rotate 270 degrees clockwise. And if they are dealing with a left piece, then they need to rotate 180 degrees. Boom, there it is. So, what did I do? Depending on the orientation of this piece right here, one of these four modules is going to output a one signal, right? And each one signal is going to be, is encoded sorry, is connected to a circle signal of a different color. So in this case, if we're dealing with the top or orientation, we get the yellow circle signal. Okay, now let's follow this signal around. Let's follow it along. It moves up here. Here it is. And after all the stacking bits, this signal is connected to the filters, right? And that is going to make sure that this filter is set to zero and the other one is set to one. So in case we are dealing with a shape that's located on top and we need to rotate 90 degrees, then that means that this filter needs to be set to zero and this filter needs to be set to one. If we are dealing with a 180 degree uh, rotation, then this filter needs to be set to one uh, sorry, to zero, and this filter needs to be set to one. If we are dealing with a 270 degree clockwise rotation or 90 degrees counterclockwise, then both of these filters are set to zero. And in cases where we don't need to rotate, which is the case either because we are dealing with a right half piece or we are dealing with a flat piece, then both of these filters are set to one and the uh, pieces continue, the, uh, yeah, the pieces continue straight forward. Phew, that was quite the explanation, but I hope you got it, right? So that's the way that's the way that works. And you know, that's that's how I made use of that encoding thing I talked about in my previous video. So that I, I I find that very interesting. I think it's a very powerful and useful technique to get a lot of information connected from one module on one part of the map to another module in another part of the map with just one line that you ha have to draw from um, from A to B, just one wire. Okay, that was the point of my discourse. Now, let's see what else is there. Um, yeah, there is a final thing I need to talk about. However, I think I'm going to keep that for another video. So the stacking, unfortunately, this final stacking right here, it is not as straightforward as it seems. It is not, unfortunately, it is not as straightforward as connecting the first piece to the first module, the second piece to the second, the third to the third, etc. Sometimes I may need to redirect these pieces into different modules. And that's what these filters do right here. But I think it's the best the I think it's best if we keep kept that for another video, right? So I have these modules, I have these lines, and they go, they're going to determine how these shapes are going to be redirected, how these pieces are going to be redirected, if at all. Um, but that will be for some other time. I think we're going to leave it at this. So I hope I talked about everything without mumbling too much. I know I slipped up a couple of times, but I hope all in all everything was clear. So five pieces, basically, you know, basically this is just a regular MAM when you think about it. You know, it, it has the five pieces and if you're dealing with any shape that a regular MAM can handle, then each of these will just do a layer. That's what it comes down to, right? So this is basically just an MAM, a regular one. And all of the, let's say the T part, the true part of the MAM is found within the wiring module. So um, that's what it is. Uh, nothing too difficult, I think. Nothing too strenuous on the brain. That's how that works. I hope you are excited for the fifth, pe fifth uh, part of the series because um, it's going to start getting more complicated. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's going to start uh, getting more complicated as we move ahead, as we progress through the series. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you had a fun time watching. Thank you for watching. 
Um, I look forward to the fifth part. I hope you do too as well. I hope to see you then and there. So have a lovely day. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye.